So yeah, I think I've done that now. So good evening to everyone. Welcome from the YouTubes. Uh, quick intro for myself, Alex at Norfolk Developers. Quick bit about what we're doing the rest of this month. In fact, I think there's only one left now, if memory serves correctly, but decentralized the community with Laravel, uh, a look at our marketeer app that we're using to replace Buffer. Uh, a quick note about our virtual social club, which is now on Discord. We're looking forward to trying out the updates and hopefully not melting some MacBooks this week. Uh, so yeah, join the Discords uh, from 5.30 on Fridays. We played a little bit of code names last week. It was pretty good. Hosted by you, as usual, a shout out to anybody and everyone that would like to come and speak at Norfolk Developers. If you know somebody that would, you'd like us to quote unquote hassle, uh, we will go and uh, deploy the Alex, as it's been referred to, and I will go and hassle them, and we'll get them to talk, as, as I did with Kevin this evening. <laughs> uh, quick shout out to our, uh, the illustrious user story, Tom, and the team over at the user story for sponsoring our Discord. There is a quarterly prize that <laughs> heated up over the weekend. Dom is currently, of course, at the top of that leaderboard uh, for, I think, is it talking? Dom, that you're at the top of that leaderboard for. I, I, I am, I am the, the one who spouts the most rubbish on chat and the second most active, which I, no, third most active, which I find. <laughs> well, fortunately, Dom is out of the running because he already won it. So a £50 Bimaroni voucher to, I believe, Damien at the moment in second place, but we'll see at the end of this month. And then it kicks off for another three-month quarterly engagement. <laughs> Sponsors, as always, we're looking. Uh, we have had a couple of conversations, but if you would like to sponsor us, please do. Shout out to our patrons who have literally kept the lights on over COVID. Um, thank you. See our everywhere for links, I guess. And finally, a quick mention to, uh, of course, a Kevlin Henny out in the wild. We caught one recently, courtesy of Neil, uh, on the side of a garbage truck which i think is um, quite apt yes. to be quite frank uh, take, take it off pop it in the back garbage in anyway. garbage out you know yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> anyway like i say i'm going to get out of the way and pass swiftly on to kevlin thank you again kevlin right awesome so i have the con brilliant so if you are in if you're on youtube i i can't see the chat on youtube if you are on Zoom, then I can see the chat. So you um, may interject things. I have a I have a chat window up to one side. Um, so um, if something takes your fancy, you want to throw me cheap abuse or even expensive abuse, um, <laughs> th throw it throw it into the chat, and I'll kind of like pick it up asynchronously. Um, uh, otherwise, we'll take uh, some we'll have some more Q and A uh, at the end. So let us use the miracle that is screen share and uh, enjoy the delight that is Stonehenge. Um, and uh, yeah. so what am I talking about here? Talking about old stuff, legacy systems. Nah, actually, no, I'm gonna talk about refactoring. And specifically, I want to address a kind of concern that, uh, or kind of a misguidance that the, the word has taken on, it has a number of different meanings, refactoring. Uh, when I talk to some people, they talk about refactoring and say, oh, well, we don't really get the time to refactor. And I'm sitting there going like, well, that's a really stupid thing to say if you knew what refactoring was. It's just like, yeah, we can't get a sprint to do refactoring. It's like, okay, maybe you can't get a sprint to do refactoring. But every time you touch the keyboard is an opportunity for refactoring. Um, uh, you know, the, the, there's a kind of classic quote about writing. There's no, uh, um, you know, the rewriting is the only kind of re of writing. That is what is going on. So refactoring is something that happens in the moments. It's not just a grand scheme. So some people mistake refactoring for always being a grand act. Typically, if it gets large enough that you're going around asking for lots of permission. In other words, you need flight clearance. And it's going to appear on the radar. There's a very good chance that what you're dealing with is not refactoring. Um, what you're dealing with is actually re-engineering. Re-engineering is a separate activity that encompasses refactoring or includes it, but actually it's a separate project. Uh, refactoring, so most big refactorings are not big refactorings. They're actually re-engineerings. So th there's a kind of a structural thing there in terms of scale. Now, at the other end of the scale, I find some people use the word refactoring. Um, I use the word refactoring uh, to... Uh, refer to only the things that they can access from within their environment. In other words, their IDE and shortcut keys, uh, you know, oh, extract method, rename, those are refactorings. Anything else that you do to code, that's not refactoring. 
then I find uh, some people who use the term refactoring as just a fancy way of saying change. You know, say, oh yeah, well, yeah, I'm refactoring. Oh, what are you doing? I'm fixing a bug. Well, that's called bug fixing. I'm afraid you can't, you don't get to use another term. It's not refactoring. It sounds refactoring sounds much cooler, but refactoring has a very particular meaning. But the key thing here, and hence the motivation for the title, and therefore um, the, uh, uh, the the awesome graphics put up by Alex uh, to promote this. The whole point here is that some people do just go, oh, refactoring, it's my, it's in my ID. We didn't used to do refactoring. Honestly, I'm pretty sure I've been doing refactoring of my code for all of my career, even before I knew it was called that. I need something that does the same thing, and I'm not going to make big rewrite changes. I'm going to make small, modest changes. Um, so we sometimes see people ad adopting the word to mean something completely different. In fact, funnily enough, ironically enough, um, given that he was involved in the Agile Manifesto, there is a book by um, uh, uh, Andy Hunt, uh, talk, uh, which is entitled, um, uh, subtitled, Refactoring Your Wetware. The idea is it's about your brain and thinking. No, that's not how you use the word correctly. So let's explore what that actually means, a little bit of the history, but also the idea that I don't, ex refactoring, don't get locked into your IDE. That is not, um, most of the design that happens is not going to be provided by your IDE. And that's not a limitation of um, uh, existing refactoring tools. It's because I would not expect them to. There are design changes that are functionally equivalent that I would not expect a tool to offer me uh, a suggestion for. So for most people, when they think about refactoring, they are thinking about response to legacy code. Um, and it's, um, so, you know, this is, this is kind of a fairly standard piece of legacy. We're not entirely sure what it was for. We have some vague ideas, a couple of years, a couple of times a year, it does something useful. Um, uh, we don't know why they built it. We don't know uh, what their vision was. Uh, it turns out to be very difficult to maintain. Uh, it turns out it came from a different system as well. If you actually, there's some really interesting discoveries about it. But part of the reason I've got this up here is for the word monolith, monolithos, one big stone, hard to move stone. Now, Recently, recent years, people, the, the word um, monolith has been um, uh, appropriated by the microservices crowd to mean something slightly different. Um, monolith just used to mean, oh my goodness, it's a hell of a slab of code. Um, these days, monolith now means, oh, you're, oh my God, you're running something in one process. How, you know, how terrible. That's not the original meaning of the term. When people used to talk about monolithic code, it's because it's one big stone that's hard to move. Basically, it's a microservice, yeah, or rather what these days people call microservices architecture. One big stone that's hard to move, but now we've divided it across uh, lots of um, uh, different processes to make our life more interesting. Um, so many people kind of think about refactoring as a response to bad code, and I want to put that one to rest. It is not just about the bad stuff. It can also be about the good stuff and the better stuff. But our instinct um, is a little bit... Um, uh, is, a, is a little bit based on that. Uh, good observation there from Dom about the, uh, the upgrade to Woodhenge. Yeah, but some of the stones actually, interestingly enough, um, traveled very specifically for other reasons. So Woodhenge was part of the story. Um, that it, it, it's, it's messier than that. Now, just in time for this talk, it's as if Alex and I had arranged it. As you can see by the URL, the date was earlier this week. Commit strip came out, which is just like, you know, they're, they're not publishing at the frequency that they're used to. They came out with one, uh, just, I thought this is perfect. It's designed for this talk. So said the project manager to the developer, will refactoring the code improve the loading time? Not really. Will it improve security then? No. So it's for browser compatibility? Absolutely not. So tell me, why is it always the same old story with you guys wanting to refactor everything? I need to know. Because as devs, if we know we've left messy code, we can't stop thinking about it. When we wake up in the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening, when we go home and when we're trying to go to sleep, it haunts us. It haunts us, you know. And it's just like, yeah, actually, it's got a point. But that's just the bad stuff. It's not all bad. Sometimes there is an idea. The idea is that we have created something. It's a first thought. Maybe it's a use of a library. It's a way of approaching a problem. And... As we, as we move away from the kind of linear thinking we are familiar with in front of a keyboard, move away um, and you know, go and do some washing up, um, walk around the garden, uh, something like that. And then you kind of think, wait a minute, there's a better way of doing that. Or I think there might be an issue if we try to, ah, okay, you suddenly see a better way. You're basically creating a software architecture. Refactoring is reactive design. And 
architecture is where we put this stuff. And it's this idea of um, understanding that developers live inside the architecture. We need our architecture to be habitable, which means we care about its qualities, but it also means there's active renovation there. And when we come to refactoring, uh, it's this um, lovely quote from uh, George Pentecost, the angel in the marble. I've seen this quote misattributed to Michelangelo, so it's off by a few centuries. And of course, the web will quite happily give you, uh, it'll probably tell you that Abraham Lincoln and Einstein also said it. No, it was George Pentecost where I managed to track it down. There is a beautiful angel in that block of marble and I am going to find it. All I have to do is knock off the outside pieces of marble and be very, very careful not to cut into the angel with my chisel. It's about revealing design in this particular case. So let's look at a definition. Refactoring, considered as a noun, a change made to the internal structure of software to make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify without changing its observable behavior. Now, um, that's a pretty good one. It's missing one thing, actually. Um, uh, there's a couple of nuances here that are missing, one of which is related to, actually, we do sometimes, um, we may end up changing some aspect of behavior, but it's non-semantic behavior. Now, this is the definition I'm quoting directly from, you know, where are we? This book. So, um, 1999 or is it 2000 i think i think it's officially oh no it's 1999 i'm pretty sure as i saw martin give a talk on refactoring a workshop on refactoring january 1999 just before this book was published um just before i was able to get my hands on it and um this is before we had automated refactoring as standard in fact you know there are there were tools uh, back then but they were very very niche no no nobody would be convinced to buy them and really this um, rose on the wave of interest that was coming in um, about extreme programming at the time. And the idea that it was legitimate to have feedback cycles in your design approach, that it was okay to react to things. Um, you weren't doomed to a fate of terrible code um, always. 20 years on, um, so this was written um, using JUnit, JUnit 3 and Java at the time. So it feels pretty archaic um, in, in some ways. Um, uh, this book now embraces um, much more fully um, the fact that 20 years of history have gone by. And, you know, just to prove that we've moved forward, it uses JavaScript. Hmm. Yeah, okay. That might not have been a kind of uh, mark of progress, but it is much more up to date, uh, makes observations um, that are um, uh, not visible in the first one. But Martin still breaks down every refactoring into its primitives, not assuming. He's basically saying, look, some of these refactorings you may not have automated support for, or you should know what goes on behind them. But the idea of refactoring predates this stuff. Certainly Martin didn't invent it, nor did Kent Beck. Um, and in fact, not even Bill Opdyke invented it, but he did the most to effectively promote it. So his PhD, which started in the late 1980s, um, uh, and he was involved there. Importantly, you may notice if you read the blurb from his PhD, the front, the front cover, um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which um, I know as being, that's where Ralph Johnson is. And lo and behold, that's his advisor, Ralph Johnson, one of the gang of four. He's been responsible for a number of things and particularly promoting interest in refactoring. Um, and so this dates back to a long way. And the original refactoring work was done on C++. So it's kind of interesting that originally automated refactoring started with C++ and we're kind of always there. It's kind of the last one through the door. Um, but he was very clear. The refactorings are defined to be behavior preserving. Again, let's, let's deconstruct that a little bit because it's not quite right. So a kind of a right hand rule way of thinking about what are the qualities of my code that are observable and measurable. Um, functional, operational, developmental. Okay, these are, now sometimes people will kind of bundle these things. They'll try and bundle operational and developmental together and call them non-functional. Honestly, people, we need to get out of the habit of using that word. It's a crappy word. It's not just a failure of imagination. It's not, it's a classic example of, oh gosh, naming's hard, so we won't bother. Um, hey, what are those features over there? Oh, those are the functional features. And what are those ones over there? Well, they're not those ones. Brilliant, okay. So, if you have two children, who you consider naming your second one, not whatever the first name one, uh, firstly named one was, that's really not a useful way of defining it. Tell me what it is. But when you look closely, you realize it's not a thing, it's two things. Um, functional, the functional qualities of code are runtime qualities that relate to its semantics. Uh, it is values, it is interactions that are observable and measurable and meaningful. 
Then we have the operational capabilities of that code, things like performance and memory usage. These are also runtime qualities. Um, and then we have developmental, which are not runtime qualities. In other words, they have nothing to do with the operational and the functional side. What is the quality of the code like? What is the developmental experience that we might have? In other words, these exist at development time. Um, so there is a distinction between these. And what we are trying to do is understand that when we are making changes to the code, we're moving along one axis or another. Um, Hemel makes an observation. Um, yeah, Dom's asking, yeah, waiting to find out originally came out of Xerox Park. To the best of my knowledge, no, refactoring didn't. But yes, Hemel, Smalltalk was the original, um, the, uh, the refactoring browser, the original refactoring browser was Smalltalk. Uh, Ralph Johnson is a small talker. Um, the people who are involved in the refactory, um, uh, people like uh, Joe Yoda and so on, they're small talkers. It was all done in small talk. That's why it didn't take off. Um, <laughs> basically, a niche language for a niche platform. Um, in the early 90s, you could, um, you could only run small talk on a 32 bit workstation which is great, except that everybody's running 16-bit um, uh, uh, machines. Um, you know, the number of people running 16-bit machines vastly outweigh the number of people who are running 32-bit machines. Uh, and that is why people have, uh, you'll find more people from that era who have fond memories of Turbo C and Turbo Pascal than have of Smalltalk. I tried running Smalltalk on a PC at the time. Um, it, was, um, it was an interesting experience in slow. Um, it really was, a, a, it was a not worth the effort. Um, so um, that would be um, that would be kind of like part of the history there. So let's go back to this right hand rule. What are we doing when we make a change? Well, let's look at bug fixing. Because even I mentioned bug fixing earlier on. <laughs> when you are fixing a bug, what you are doing is you're improving the functionality. So that's a plus on the functional axis. Yeah, because <laughs> what is a bug? It's a shortfall. <laughs> hey, we promised you this functionality, but you got this much. That gap, that's a bug. Okay, so we're making up for a deficit in that. What happens to performance, memory usage? Yeah, you know, maybe it gets better, maybe it gets worse. It, go, it could go either way. Developmental quality, maybe, maybe the code improves, maybe it stays the same, maybe it gets worse. These are, um, these are not constrained. We don't have an intention on these axes. The main goal of bug fixing is to improve the functional axis. Now, let's go optimization. Optimization is semantics preserving. Okay, there's no use in saying, yep, we've made this 10 times faster, but it's buggy. Yeah, but the bugs are really fast. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's really important. It needs to be functionality preserving. So that needs to stay the same. Our goal, our intention is to improve one or more aspects of the operational axis. What happens to the developmental axis? You know, maybe it gets more complex. Maybe things get a bit messier. Um, for example, many performance characteristics uh, are improved by doing special cases. Um, doing special case handling. So I add more code complexity. Oh, let's add a cache. Yep, you just made the code more complex. Okay, um, code without a cache is always simpler than code with a cache. That's not to say that putting the cache in is bad, you've got a trade-off, okay? So one aspect improved, something else got more complex. But sometimes we need to kind of remember that sometimes the change that you make that gets you the performance actually simplifies the code. Uh, the kind of classic quote for me on this one is um, the intelligent guide to designing programs. There is no code faster than no code. Sometimes getting rid of something is both an improvement in performance and it's an improvement in the uh, development experience. And then we hit refactoring. Now, this is the important thing. Refactoring is like um, optimization. It is a functionality preserving transformation. Um, and that is what automated refactoring tools are about. They are about the semantics preservation. Refactoring tools take no account of the operational behavior. So whenever anybody says, oh yeah, they preserve behavior. No, that's not true. Performance characteristics are also behavior. They mean semantics. So it's, it's unfortunately, and if I'm gonna be picky and you could say, yeah, Kevin's being a bit pedantic here, of course, because it's semantics. We're talking about meaning. If you say something about meaning, then you better mean it. Refactorings are semantics preserving. They are not behavior preserving. There is more to behavior than just semantics. There are characteristics of time and the tools do not currently deal with that. But it basically means you make a change and maybe things improve um, in the operational aspect as well, or maybe they get a bit slower or use a bit more memory and that's all good. Um, so what about doing it? The verb to restructure software by applying a series of refactorings without changing the observable behavior of the software. Awesome. How do we do this? Um, well, the advice, the best advice we get um, 
the best advice we get um, comes from Isabella Beaton. Um, uh, so she um, uh, she published a series of um, uh, pamphlets and articles uh, in the 19th century. Um, she had a bit of a deadbeat husband who was in publishing but managed to lose money. She actually made the money. Um, she then collected all these things together in Book of Household Management, which you can actually still find in print in certain places. Um, uh, had a very long influence. Uh, sadly, she died uh, in childbirth about the age of 30, but left behind the greatest advice for refactoring before refactoring. Oh, this is even like this predates Babbage and, and Lovelace. Um, and cleverly, she used the metaphor of a kitchen. Cunning. There is no work like early work. Clear as you go. Muddle makes more muddle. Not to wash plates and dishes soon after using makes more work. There you go. That's everything we can stop talk right now. I've told you everything you need to know about refactoring. Um, that's really the essence of how we apply it. We don't save it up for a, a sprint. Uh, occasionally that may be necessary, but sometimes we need to reevaluate whether or not um, that is actually a re-engineering activity or some uh, uh, something else. But let's talk about automation. That was what Bill Opdyke was uh, in, uh, into, and that's what a lot of people tend to associate refactoring. It's a tool. It's an automated tool. It's not a thing that goes on in here. It's a thing that happens here. It's like, no, that's not quite right. It's a, it's a, it's refactoring is about design, and you can enlist tools, and some of the tools hit exactly what you need perfectly. I need to rename something. Um, so he has that, but um, Let's just, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna start off with a refactoring that actually I don't expect tools to, to use. So I've got a, a simple uh, piece of JavaScript here. Um, I call this function new stack and it returns me um, a fully encapsulated um, version of a stack um, using a, a closure based approach rather than a class based approach. Um, Lambda calculus was the original object oriented language. So I'm gonna stick with that. Um, and here I have got a stack, I'm building my stack um, out of um, uh, an array and I've got four operations on it uh, that I'm interested in depth top pop and push and I am using um, I am using my array um, counting from zero as the top that's great now I'm going to now reverse the implementation so that I now use the last element so I append um, to achieve stackness so it now goes to the back now this is um, this is semantically equivalent. There may be a slight uh, change in performance, but I don't expect to find refactorings that say, oh, reverse usage of list. I don't think that's unreasonable, but that's not really where um, uh, uh, those who are writing refactoring engines are putting their time and effort. Um, and so we don't expect to really see that, but I've just given you a refactoring that is not automated and is unlikely to be automated, even though it's entirely reasonable. One that is more popular, um, and one I'm going to borrow from the book I edited, uh, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, about just over a decade ago. Uh, one from Dan Turhorse North, Code in the Language of the Domain. And this is very much about this idea of intention and moving your code towards more intention revealing, uh, a more intention revealing structure. So he's got this piece of logic here. A portfolio IDs by trader ID, get trader.get ID contains key portfolio.get ID. Now, honestly, all of those names are actually pretty decent. I can't fault that. There's no renaming I want to do that is within my reach. Um, uh, the only abbreviation there is actually a real world abbreviation, ID. Um, so it's not an abbreviation made by a programmer. It's all pretty good. And people might go, hey, I'm not, I'm not sure what this does. Maybe I need a comment. What would you put in the comment? Well, actually this is to prevent insider dealing. Um, uh, it's, it's actually to do with uh, governance. It is to do with whether or not a particular trader can view a particular portfolio. Now, that is an important idea because we want to move beyond the idea that, hey, everything's just renamed. But what we've done there is we have named a grouping of a concept and we have extracted that. And it's just like, yeah, this is great. And our tools can do that for us really easily. In other words, and particularly in the Java world, Java has enjoyed um, the best uh, the most attention to refactoring of any language. Um, you know, it's been there since very close to the start um, and particularly on Java's growth curve. Uh, refactoring is kind of part and parcel. If you were about to enter the IDE market for Java and you said, yeah, we'll go without, um, we're an IDE, but we won't have a refactoring tool. People kind of look at you funny. It's just like, really? I mean, you, 
you do know what Java is, you do know what people's expectations are. If you want to enter the market without a refactoring tool, go for C and C++. The developers, they have no idea what they're missing. Um, it, but you know, for, for Java, no, that, you, that's just not going to fly. And we've had that. So do you know one of the great things about that? One of the best things about that is there's no, there's no legacy code in Java because everybody's been using refactoring for two decades. And likewise, C Sharp, even Microsoft Visual Studio had refactoring from the beginning. So therefore there's no legacy C Sharp because it's just so easy to get rid of most problems. Yeah, I, I don't understand. This is, I posted this the other week. Um, one of the great things about languages in modern ID support is that thanks to refactoring tools, legacy code is a thing of the past. Unlike uh, with all the languages, developers never have to experience long methods, rounding classes, poor identifier names, or complex logic. Those are a thing of the past. We've so it's a solved problem. Yeah. Some people didn't catch on that I was, some people don't know that I have a sense of humor. Honestly, I have no idea how they reached that conclusion and thought that I was being serious. But I am being serious. I am being serious. Why the, why the hell do we have such shit code? when the simplest solution for most of, oh, we've got a long method. Oh, we've got, I wonder, how, do we have any ways of extracting things? Oh, we have refactoring tools, but we never use them. It's just like, have you thought about maybe using the tools? These, this is a solved problem. Everything I've listed on that screen is a solved problem. This I think is one of my pet, uh, uh, one of my pet frustrations is that people keep coming up with, oh, Software industry, it needs to do new stuff. No, we don't. We just need to use the stuff we've already got. Um, if we actually applied the technology that, of 20 years ago to the stuff that we have now, we will solve most of the productivity and cost issues and bug issues just by putting into practice stuff that we knew 20 years ago. But apparently we need more stuff. Um, so, okay, rant over. Seriously though. Um, some general refactoring questions. I, I said, right, okay, because I knew I was going to be doing a, a talk at some point. I thought, you know, I, I'd like some answers to these questions. One, what family of refactorings do you find you use most, whether it's automated or not? What refactorings do you feel are most overlooked or underutilized by you or others in practice? So let's focus on the first one. Um, so, um, yeah, so I've got some great suggestions, by the way, in, uh, uh, in the... Um, uh, in the chat, um, uh, David's observed, I am trolling. Absolutely. I'm trolling the whole industry. I have no individuals in mind. I'm just doing everybody. It's a broadcast troll. Um, Enterprise Fizzbrus, if you have not come across that, it is a work of art. It is a work of joy, uh, the kind of joy that will make you weep. Um, I do recommend just Google Enterprise Fizzbrus when you have time. Uh, and then uh, Hemel's uh, thrown in abstract FizzBuzz strategy policy factory as, as one of the great examples of the kind of stuff you can, the kind of enterprise quality stuff you can find in there. And of course, new stuff is shiny. We, we go after that. But particularly when we're dealing with techniques, it is, we are not very good at taking advantage of the knowledge we have. And I'm not going to blame software developers for this. You know what? This is part and parcel of being human. You get this for free with being human. You get the opportunity to not learn from your mistakes. You get the opportunity to not learn from your past. So, yeah, um, fortunately, that's that's you get that free with every human. Um, and, you know, we can find it within ourselves. Our own habits uh, fail um, uh, uh, on multiple counts. But at least the first step is awareness. Do we actually have this as a problem? So what what are we using? The, a couple of these were not surprising. I made a couple of predictions. Uh, one of the ones I predicted extract method and rename. Yeah, it turns out these are these are pretty much the standard ones that people reach for. Um, rename obviously has boundaries, um, um, you know, and as Martin points out, don't publish interfaces prematurely because you may find that if you publish them, you can't refactor them uh, because you are now moving outside of your code base that you own. If you move beyond, uh, once you've published an interface beyond your team or beyond your repo, uh, or rather beyond your dependence, in other words, anybody using it, if you can't see their code, if you can't access their code, then effectively that's a published interface. This is no longer about automated refactoring. This is a social um, thing. Um, so the point here is um, what you want to do is modify your code ownership policies to smooth refactoring, which basically means modify your architecture. Um, you want to actually, um, so there's a, there is a, Common common guideline that I see being utterly misinterpreted. It's part of, um, part of the solid principles. Robert Martin advocated that we follow the open close principle. 
Unfortunately, Robert Martin did not correctly understand where the open close principle came from. It's from this book here, Object Oriented Software Construction. Open close principle is not an object oriented design principle. It is a programming language design principle. If you read this book, you will understand um, what that is for. But actually there's a lot of other crappy stuff in that book, so I wouldn't necessarily bother. But even if we ignore the fact that it already has a meaning that's nothing to do with object oriented design, it's actually a bad practice. Do not apply open close principle because the open close principle basically states you want all of your classes to be open to extension. In other words, inheritance, that is what is defined as and they should be closed for modification. Absolutely not, absolutely not. This is bad practice. That interpretation, so we've got one interpretation of OCP, the open close principle, that is wrong. And then we've got another interpretation that's actually bad practice. Now, I happen to be in favor of ideas, uh, the, the original ideas of agile development. I want my code base to be agile. Open close principle basically says, tough, you can't change stuff. Once you're done, you're done. No, I want to re read a book by somebody who's, uh, who's, who's focused much more on the Agile stuff, like Martin Fowler. Change your code so you can make changes. Your goal is to avoid having your code fall into the point where you cannot modify it. You are trying to minimize the amount of code that you cannot modify. Okay, The whole point of good development is to maximize the amount that is freely changeable, open to modification. That is the strategy you want. OK, and perhaps it could also be open for extension, in which case we call that OOP, open and open programming principle. So there we go. So just some thoughts there. So, yeah, don't be distracted by uh, SOLID. It's kind of a cute acronym, but it doesn't actually tell you how to develop good software. Uh, and please, OCP, just don't. But every now and then we do hit something that has a boundary and it falls into that boundary. One of the most popular ones we can actually find um, is uh, this one as an example of a, an interface, a name that cannot be changed. This is from Java, it's clonable. Uh, if you are, you know, and it's all the .NET folk out there, I clonable. What is the correct way to spell clonable in English? Um, yeah, so the point there is that neither Oracle nor Microsoft are in a position to be able to correct the spelling because the whole idea is that that code is actually closed to change because it has been published. It is beyond refactoring. By the way, though, um, successfully, if you go and look at Wiktionary, as, a, as an industry, we have changed the spelling of this. We have made that spelling mistake normal and standard. So always remember, public APIs like diamonds are forever. You want to minimize that. So we can't rename everything. But yeah, it turns out extract method and rename are the most popular. Right, what about the ones that people overlook? Extract class. <laughs> you know, that's a biggie. Um, extracting class. Take a big class, turn it into lots of smaller classes. That one eludes people. The method is a local movement, but extract class, we can understand there is a, an idea that you're stepping sideways. Um, and people are not sure about that one. There's a hesitancy about that one. Um, inlining things, the reverse of extract. Okay, sometimes you need, uh, you know, you'll find that many refactorings come in pairs. Um, replacing things with alternative constructs. Okay, um, one of the classic ones is replacing um, things that are uh, uh, kind of switch based code with polymorphism. That's a real classic, but there's lots and lots that do not, um, do not. Uh, have well-defined names. So re replacing my favorite one that I've been using since I discovered you could do lookup tables in C, you know, I, my favorite refactorings um, and one of my favorite structures is I use lookup tables. And honestly, it gets rid of lots of nasty control flow. Um, and so that's a kind of standard thing. Lookup tables plus lambdas, you're away. It's fantastic. But we don't see enough of this. And delete, getting rid of stuff. Honestly, we could do better with that. Um, this is what I refer to and have referred to over the years as decremental development. Um, you know, sometimes you got to kind of do this stuff. It's not all about adding. Sometimes you have to kind of think about this, get rid of stuff. Now, the process, if we follow, um, uh, if we follow uh, 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 Mrs. Beaton's guide, um, then we follow a process of Kaizen. Uh, Kaizen, uh, a whole load of, la um, of uh, Japanese vocabulary got invected, uh, it's kind of injected into the agile space um, when lean came along. When lean software development became a thing, 
a lot of people started looking at what the origin stories of things like the Toyota production system were, and this idea of gradual improvement, progressive improvement. It's gradual, it's continuous. That fits very much with the way we often think about um, refactoring. So let's have a look at where that works and where that doesn't work. So um, page that I run on Facebook, words and language stuff. And occasionally, I don't do it as much these days, but on a Friday, I will uh, sometimes profile a word of interest or a phrase of interest. And one of the great ones I really love is biquinary coded decimal. That's a bit of a challenge to drop into a conversation. Now I say that because I do know that somebody um, used to take the word Fridays that I would put out and try and casually use the word in a conversation over the weekend. I am not entirely sure how to drop this casually into a conversation. Um, but if you have any suggestions, please, um, uh, you know, uh, feel free, don't hold back. So biquinary coded decimal, a system of representing numbers based on counting in fives. Ha, huh, there we go. And there's normally, <laughs> I wonder where that came from. Um, and there's a first five and a second five. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or zero through four um, and uh, uh, five to nine. So we've got an, an indicator for that one or that one. Um, you find it in classic abacus systems, not the kind of abacus systems you give to your kids because um, this would just mess with them. These are the ones that you still actually find used um, in some markets around the world, um, you know, five plus two, um, upper and lower range of your five. Um, and somebody who's um, somebody who has uh, uh, skills in this can really, is, is it massively impressive? Um, but it turns out one of the other ones that it did used to be used in um, uh, computers before people kind of figured out that, you know, binary might be easier, uh, but they faked up a decimal system um, uh, uh, using this. And the original Colossus actually had this um, as its system. But the classic, it's got to be Roman numerals. It's a system of fives. We see it everywhere. Um, it's also the basis for a fairly classic um, a coding carter that is used. And I'm going to offer you a solution to this classic coding carter, which is you take a number and then you convert it to a string. Okay, take an integer, convert it to a string um, uh, that in, in Roman numerals. And yeah, clearly we're going to need more space. So here it is in all its glory. Um, enterprise style, not the kind of enterprise, enterprise fizz buzz, which is over architected. This is under architected. This is a really crappy solution. I have really gone at the thing and it's very, it's very imperative. It's very procedural. It's all about state change. Um, there's no, uh, there's no attempt at abstraction. Um, and what I find absolutely fascinating is, uh, so I've got, I put a book on Pascal there. Now, a lot of people used to talk about Pascal as being, oh, this is such a great language. It's so well designed. You learn such good things from it. I even have a copy of the user. I, I have copies of old books. I quite like collecting old books. I mean, it's classic. I mean, look at that font. Come on, people. This is the, this is the kind of stuff that leaving the 1970s behind, we, we just don't have this stuff anymore. And people often talk about Pascal and say, oh, it's such a great language. Really? Have you ever actually tried to use Pascal? Yeah, most it, you can't program anything useful in Pascal. Pascal is such a cruddy language that it, 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 people kept having to extend it. Yeah, every time I'm every time I diss Pascal, and honestly, I have a little love affair with Pascal a few years ago, but honestly, it was a brief fling and we really didn't get on. Um, Pascal is such a bad language that it always has to be extended. The only people I know who rave about Pascal rave about object Pascal. Yeah, yeah, take all that stuff out and try and use the core language. You will not get very far. Um, you will be pissed off very quickly. And as for good practice, well, I was leafing through it a while back. I didn't realize the, the Roman numerals problem goes back to the 1970s. Um, here it is. And look at the style that um, Nicholas Wirth has used, as well as putting multiple statements on one line. Okay, that was a 70s thing. He has basically, uh, this is not the exact Roman numerals, he's looking for factors, but he has used exactly the thing that I just said, don't do this. This is stupidly procedural. Use it, learn to use abstraction, learn to program. So I'm very, yeah, very cautious when it's, yeah, Pascal, it's really good. It teaches you good practice. No, it doesn't. Uh, good practice comes from somewhere else. So we need to refactor this. Um, and um, Dom, Dom's just, uh, 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 Steve, so a number of things here. Dom's just said the Roman numeral code doesn't support clock faces. Steve, that's presentation layer. You, that, that's, that's a different team, UI people. Uh, Steve Love has mentioned modular. 
Yes. Yeah, I've got one of those as well. And I did actually teach mod modular a few years ago, and I do have a softer spot. Modular is actually a proper language. Um, Pascal's kind of like a warm up, if you like. Um, and sometimes our warm up sessions aren't quite so good. Um, so, um, observation from Martin Fowler refactoring changes the program in small steps. Um, if you make a mistake, it is easy to find the bug. That's why we do this. Okay, now, um, how do we find the bug with this code? Um, right, so that was Python. I'm just gonna to put together a really simple test. You don't need a testing framework to do testing. And here I've got a simple number of cases of transformation and a very simple thing, just using the built-in Python assertion that will quite happily um, you know, uh, list out all the cases that fail if there is a uh, uh, if, if there is an obvious bug that we find. Okay, so it's a, it's a sample-based um, uh, stuff. I'm tempted to just lob languages. Do I have books? Yes, I was the reviewer for an Ada 95 book on the Ada 95 standards. Hang on. There we go. So I was the principal reviewer for this one, which is based on the Ada 95 standard. Yes, and it's not the only Ada book I have, but I'm gonna stop going again. Well, it's great fun. It's, I have to admit, it's great fun. But one thing about the pandemic, being at home, is I can actually access the books that I've got. Um, actually, Jez, you're saying that LMAO is not a real language. I wouldn't be so sure. I haven't checked, but I bet somebody out there has created it as an ESOLang. Um, it really would not surprise me. So um, so anyway, we've got tests. Let's go and back to our code. We're going to improve it. Now, um, the way that people will normally approach this, they'll go, oh, yeah, right. We're going to extract something. There's a lot of regularity here. And people kind of, they're looking for something. And they reach for extract method or rename. Actually, all the names here are fairly decent. So let's reach for extract method. And what tends to grab people's eyes is there's a grouping of four that repeats and then one left over. In other words, it's this four. What we're seeing is there's a while, if, 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 while and so, some 10 something, if nine something, if a five something, if a four something, okay? So if we're dealing with, this could be 10, nine, five and four, okay? So uh, X, I, X, V, I, V, or we could be dealing with 100, 90, 50, 40, okay? So C, X, C, um, L and X, L. Um, so that kind of thing. So people go, oh, I'm going to extract this. Stop. Extract method is not the right place to start with this. We need to take a step back. And this is the really important aspect that you need to kind of th this refactoring is a thinking thing. It is assisted by tools, but it is not the tools or other. That's the one that you really need to look after. We're not looking at this right. You sometimes need to spin the problem. If you look at this, while, if, 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 while, if, if, mm, based on the nature of the data, it turns out that the if behaves like a while. While is something that executes zero, one, or many times. If is something that it executes zero or one time. This is an if without an else. So basically it's a degenerate while with a limited case. If you replace all the while, all the ifs with whiles, it still passes the tests. And that is what you want to refactor. In other words, people leap for their, they leap for the shortcut too quickly. It's not a shortcut, it's a long cut. This is not a problem of data flow. And that's the problem is we see a lot of code that is relentlessly imperative when it doesn't need to be because everybody thinks it's a control flow problem. It's not a control flow problem. It's a data structuring problem. What you realize is it's the same control for everything. What you need to do is organize your stuff into a table. I did say I like tables. There we go. This is the much more, this much simpler, um, uh, some much simpler way of doing it. We have the same control flow. And now we can split this, you know, we, we can recognize that this is the greater insight. Uh, and by the way, if you want to do this in Pascal, you can't because Pascal doesn't support proper data structuring. Okay. Um, it's not a proper language. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get some flack from somebody somewhere about that one. Yeah, I, I've been so nice to people about languages over the last year and the pandemic sensibilities and all the rest of it, but honestly, I've, I've got to come back on this one. Okay, so let's look at another classic book, Mythical Man Month. Fred Brooks makes the observation, representation is the essence of programming. He says, sometimes the strategic breakthrough will be a new algorithm. Much more often, the strategic breakthrough will come from redoing the representation of the data or tables. This is where the heart of the program lies. And so that becomes the, the kind of the key observation here. 
Um, and uh, and there's a number of other things we can do with that code. We can um, we can actually hoist we, the 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 transformation is invariant. So I can do it a lifting of an invariant. In other words, the table I can lift that out. If I want, I can put it somewhere else. What's really cute is that that means that if I have a if I have a module in Python that is just the numerals, then that's effectively a configuration. So what I've just done is I've actually separated out the data part from the control flow part. And I can even be pathological and say, no, I'm going to hold it as a string um, and, and treat it like that. Or I can actually going to replace the file. Now, there's a reason I use my, uh, it turns out that this subset of Python is directly equivalent to JSON. So I've now turned my Python, put it into a separate file, and I'm now opening the file as if it were, um, uh, I'm opening a JSON file and treating it as if it were Python. Um, that might make people feel uncomfortable if I do an eval of that. So I will load it using proper JSON. But what I've just done is I have transformed the code fundamentally. I have separated out the invariant data aspect. It's a table driven problem. We can even make it configurable should we wish. Um, it's totally changed the paradigm of the code. You will not get that from an automated refactoring. Sometimes what we're looking for is something deeper than is gonna be provided by the surface tools. Um, and this is exactly the kind of stuff that Dijkstra was talking about when he said the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague because we often get people, oh yeah, it's abstract, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. That's what we're looking for with the code. We may start, I have no problem with somebody starting off with that code, the, all the ifs. It's where they take it. And the problem is we, we, we limit our options by thinking that everything is gonna be available through the shortcuts. Um, so, um, <laughs> Sorry, I've just observed. Um, I've just observed, uh, uh, you know, Don, Don's observation here uh, about me as a language. Uh, Kevin takes no arguments and no prisoners. Invoking Kevin will dump the contents of memory after every operation. Yeah, Kevin should never be invoked in production. That's true. Uh, although there are bigger issues if this is being used in production. Yeah, yeah that, that is also true. Okay, so let's have a look at another nice little refactory. Let us take. Let us take a um, little piece of control flow, little piece of Java. I'm going to take a list of words, and what I would like to do is I want to create um, an ascending unique, you know, I want a list of my words in ascending um, order, in sorted order, but uniquely, okay? So um, Java is um, uh, Java is a little bit patchy when it comes to dealing with um, uh, algorithms. So, you know, it's got sort out of the box, but it doesn't have the idea of eliminating adjacent duplicates. So you have to you have to drop a level of abstraction here, um, and that's generally considered to be not a good thing. We have, we have sort, and then suddenly we have a whole load of mechanics and ha and and uh, and bookkeeping that we suddenly drop to. What we really want is to have something called remove adjacent duplicates. Classic example of extract method. We are done. Well, no, we're not, because actually there's a stream solution. Now, some tools IntelliJ does support refactoring from control flow through to streams, but notice the shape of this solution actually looks really different to the shape of this solution. And there's a point here about the smoothness of refactoring we shouldn't always assume. It's um, probably a little more peanut butter or, or strawberry jam um, than it is raspberry jam. It's not always consistently smooth. But my favorite refactoring for this is just use the right data structure. In other words, here is a data structure that will automatically uh, make everything sorted and unique. It's intrinsic to the nature of the data structure. And that is not a suggested refactoring in any tool that I know of. Again, that's not gonna, you, this is about understanding the shape of the problem. And every now and then there is a sudden shift to go with Kaizen, there is Kaikaku. And apologies if you speak Japanese, I don't. And so I probably butchered that word tonally and, uh, and in terms of emphasis and cadence. But Kaikaku is about more sudden changes. It's the idea that every now and then in your continuous change, there's a discontinuity as you make a breakthrough. And that's the bit that sometimes we're missing with refactoring. It's not just smooth changes. Sometimes there is a moment of transition when we say, oh, wait a minute, there's something else. So this is another one from 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. And that's not the focus of the piece by Burke Huffnagel. The focus of the piece is problem solving. How do you solve a problem? Um, put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard. His observation here is, you know, if you've been, if you've been stuck if you're stuck solving a problem and you're stuck at the same level and you've been solving that problem or rather failing to solve that problem at that level, you know what? Spending more time at that level is not going to, with that frame of mind is not going to help you. 
you are stuck in a linear mode of thinking, you need to take a step back. Uh, think differently, quite literally. Um, so change, change your environment, change your mood. Uh, if you've been listening to music, um, so the way I tend to put it is like, if you're listening to music, turn off the music. That'll change the way you think. If you haven't been listening to music, turn on some music. Uh, if you've been drinking coffee, now's a good time for herbal tea. If you've just been drinking herbal tea all day, have caffeine. That will, all of these things will change your mind. In other words, that you, whatever it is that you're doing, you need to change it. You need to get away from that. So what we have here is this code is what Burke had refactored to. In other words, this is after he had refactored the code the first time, which kind of tells you it was pretty, pretty messy the first time. And uh, there's a number of operative things here. So uh, we've got try, catch, if, dot, 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 if, oh, okay, there's a lot going on in the dot, dot, dot. What we're trying to do is convert a string, a 12 hour time string, and try and, uh, and try and validate it. Is this actually a legitimate, you know, does this uh, meet our expectation? Does this match the time format? And this is very much trying to butcher it through control flow. Take, an, take a simple problem of formatting and try and strangle it with control flow. And that's pretty much what this has done. Now, this is as far, so I can't imagine what the code was like because this is after Burke had refactored it the first time, but he couldn't make any more progress. So he put the mouse down, stepped away from the keyboard. And then he came back and he's kind of looking at it going like, yeah, you know what? It's a regular expression problem. Now, the point here is uh, there's a standard joke, you know, I had a problem then I solved it with regexes, now I have two problems. Whoever made that joke really doesn't understand regexes. The correct answer to that is I had a problem and then solved it with regexes, now I have star problems, yeah? That shows knowledge of regexes. You don't have two problems, kind of what kind of foolishness is that? Okay, that's kind of funny, except, except when you try and explain it, because you see, explain this to somebody who doesn't do Java. In fact, even explain to somebody who does do Java and see if they stay awake. Explain this to somebody who doesn't do regexes. It's a declarative approach. Yeah, not all declarative approaches are fully uh, uh, Turing complete, but regular expressions are a declarative approach. What's great is I can, you know, I can, uh, I, my, my younger son, he's doing computer science GCSE, I, I know he hasn't done regular expressions yet, but I know I could explain to him reading from left to right. And that's the thing about declarative approaches. All right, what we're expecting here in this group is either a zero followed by one to nine or a one followed by zero to two, okay? And then in the next group, we're expecting a zero to five followed by a, a zero to nine, then a colon, then in the next group, zero, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're following with an AM or a PM. It's like, oh yeah, that's easy. I can read it from left to right. I, my explanation is the execution. Now you're not gonna get that refactored to that automatically. That's a Kaikaku moment, not a Kaizen moment. Now, of course, if we're gonna talk about refactoring, you've gotta talk Fizzbuzz, haven't you? Because that's like a real problem, okay? Now, you know, we've already, we already know there's an enterprise version of it, so that's how we know it's credible to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, so, um, um, so uh, Jez is actually, uh, so two observations, Dom, leap seconds. No, it wasn't originally intended to do leap seconds. If you want to do leap seconds correctly um, in a regular expression, um, you can't, uh, it's not possible um, because the regular expression doesn't have enough information to do it correctly. Um, you need more context, um, such as knowing the date, for example. Um, so anyway, we're keeping that one simple. Um, uh, the other observation Jez is making, I'm writing a regex engine at the moment. Um, I think you should reverse that. Um, so that would be backtracking there. Um, so uh, as long as the engine can go in reverse, we're good. So let, let's talk about how we're gonna test Fizzbuzz. Uh, and this is um, I, I, this is one I've, I came up with a few years ago. It's a simple property-based testing, um, but it does demonstrate how hard property-based testing uh, is. What I have is a series of truths. Fizzbuzz is normally evaluated from one to 100. Um, and uh, I'm going to basically say, right, what we need is every result is fizz or buzz, fizz buzz or a decimal string. Um, every decimal result corresponds to its ordinal position. Every third result contains fizz. Every fifth result contains buzz. Every 15th result is fizz buzz. Now, a lot of people might stop there, but actually you need the next three as well. The ordinal position of every fizz result is divisible by three. Ordinal position of every buzz result is divisible by five. And the ordinal um, position of every fizz buzz result is divisible by 50. Um, so these um, properties 
um, uh, are enough to constrain. So this is a degenerate form of property-based programming. I've used Python here, which basically means that there's really no expansion when we actually turn it into code. Um, you know, if, you did, if I were to do this in Java, then I'd have to change the font down to about three point or something like that. If I were to do it in Pascal, um, then I'd just leave the room. So the point here is that we've got our tests. And uh, a few years ago, uh, Fran Von Tempo, she saw me do this and she's included this in her machine learning book, uh, if you'd like to go and buy that. Um, so there, plug. Um, um, so I don't think I'm going to claim a, a pint off Fran for that, but there's always a chance. So here's a fairly conventional solution, one that uses accumulation. This is an imperative solution um, uh, because it uses accumulated state and side effect. Um, here we have a more functional solution uh, and is more structured solution. Um, which um, uh, uh, ensures that no, we only take one path exclusively and the tail result is always an expression. We never had to do any accumulation or modification of state. Both of these pass the tests, yeah, but it's more fun if you do it with tables, isn't it? You know, why have decision flow when you can just have tables? So this also passes the tests, but you're not going to get, the point here is that actually it's very unlikely that th this refactors to this all this refactors to this. But we often will not find tools that will do such a simple transformation, even though it's just control flow, that will radically do that. And you're not gonna get anything that's gonna do this. So in many cases, we are looking, the whole point of refactoring is that we understand sometimes we have a breakthrough moment um, and we see something different, that we are sensing our way through our design. It is not simply the clicking that matters. Um, so, um, uh, so let, let's end with um, a little bit of delight and, uh, and playfulness um, uh, uh, when it comes to um, things like um, Singleton. Um, uh, so Singleton is a, is a fine whiskey. I currently have none in stock. Or I have an empty bottle, that empty bottle actually. I think I recycled the last empty bottle. Um, but the, uh, the pattern's not much good for your code. Um, the advice that I always give out to people, you know, what's the one piece of advice you give people if they are... Um, you know, if they're going to uh, uh, do uh, TDD, what's the one piece of advice you give people if they are thinking about software architecture and patterns? What's the one piece of advice you'd give to people if they plan to stay alive on this earth? It's always the same one from Emile Auguste Chartier. Nothing is more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. You've got to open up to these possibilities that we're looking at. We narrow ourselves in too often. But when it comes to object orientation, nothing is more dangerous than OO when you have only one object, and that is the singleton pattern. So let's have a look having dealt with time. Um, um, and I don't think that device specifically accommodates uh, leap seconds. Let's have a look at a very common way that people would use singleton. Um, they might say, you know what, we're going to have time, uh, we get time from a clock, and we're going to have a single clock. As an aside, we're already off to a bad start. Um, because the idea, oh, and I'm going to make it a singleton, therefore, because you only have one clock, really? From where I'm sitting in my office, I can see four different timepieces. In my office, I already have four clocks. My computer has more than one clock. It just exposes one through system time. But at my laptop, I can have access to multiple clocks. I can choose the time here, or I can choose the time on the network. So the idea that you have a clock and there can be only one is, is, is nonsense from the, from the moment you utter the idea. So that doesn't make sense. So I'm gonna say this is already a bad design because it's false. Um, there, there is no unique master clock uh, that we should be uh, behoven to in our code. Time is a resource and we need to treat it as such. Now, let's also look at another issue um, with this approach. Uh, it means that you're, if you're familiar with the law of Demeter, which is basically um, uh, how many dots do I count, train wreck style, um, any use of singleton immediately basically means that you're in violation of this law of Demeter. Um, you've always got to go two steps to get your to get your value. But let's go back to what I've um, what I've said. Uh, Don makes a point. It's never going to cope with relativistic speeds. Um, yeah, sure it is. Everything can cope with relativistic speeds. That's the whole point of relativity. You don't know that you know you're looking at somebody else going, oh wow, they're moving. No, no, no I'm stationary. No, it's it's all about. It's all relative. So the whole point is time is a resource. Time should be considered a resource. You pass files in. What do you do with resources? Resources are not globally available. The idea that time is globally available is, is not helpful to our code. 
I don't want to have globally available files, connections, or anything like that. You pass them in. So the first thing we do is we learn, hey, guess what? You pass the clock in. Now, suddenly, the singletonness has become irrelevant. Maybe you do want to keep it a singleton, and that's fine because you've wrapped a system clock. That's fine. But that's no longer the user's dependent. Uh, that's no longer the user's uh, problem. You've hidden it from them. You know, in other words, what we've done is we have used object orientation for an object oriented problem. If you're using static, there's a very good chance that you're not doing that. But here, what we've done is we've decoupled the idea. We have parameterized the behavior of this code by using a parameter. Now, if that sounds a little bit too mundane, feel free to use the word inject. It sounds a lot more exciting. We have injected the clock into our code. It's got a kind of like druggy, druggy kind of uh, kind of edge overtone, um, but really you've just passed an argument, and that's cool. Um, what does that mean for the clock itself? It means um, the other thing that we should also get away with if I, as I'm doing this in C sharp. The idea, this is a common uh, thing. I'm not a big fan of properties, but the idea that time is accessed by property is particularly um, uh, nonsensical. Um, it's an asynchronously changing value. Think of it as being something you should request specifically rather than just being a value that is read only. Um, that's a better way of doing it. Make something that looks like it's doing work look like it's doing work. Now, the next thing is because, well, I'm gonna transform this into an interface because I don't wanna have this dependency. And the great thing is because I've decided not to use the I prefix, none of the other code changes. And if I published it, actually, it turns out it's source code compatible. That's why you don't want to use the I prefix. Um, you, you know, it allows you smoother refactoring. Um, um, but I know people will want to, I is for inject, there we go. Um, so here, now I can go and say, look, I am actually gonna have, I am wrapping the system clock but I've done such a bad job on the naming, I've ended up calling it clock impl. And so somebody will go along and say, ah, you know what? That's why we use I. So we can use clever names like clock to be implementation of I clock. If this is how you are programming, take a break. Put the, put the mouse down, step away from the keyboard. This is a terrible practice. The I prefix prevents you from having a good name. What you need to do is say, what is the clock? It's a local clock. Ah, oh, right, okay, that's cool. Um, and you can put the eyes back in if you need to, but there, you know, I, for the sake of this talk, I'm going to take them back out because I prefer to make my code more uh, consistently changeable without sending ripple effects through it. Now, if you start looking at this, you suddenly realize, well, there's a lot of horsing around. I've got to define my own interface for this. What's actually going on? I need something that when I call it, gives me the time. Well, in other words, I don't actually need a whole clock object. <laughs> And this is where you know, people fire up their whole mocking frameworks and all kinds of stuff, you know? I'm, okay, it might be an overstatement to say that most mocking frameworks exist because um, uh, uh, Java was originally not a very capable language. Um, uh, that would be a slight overstatement, but not a huge overstatement. Uh, in many languages, we don't need um, the machinery, the full machinery of many mocking frameworks because sometimes the language provides us with things that are suitable. So in some languages, the language itself is a mocking framework. Python, the whole language is a mocking framework. You don't need a mocking framework for Python. Um, but even within the context of C Sharp, I have a number of different abstractions that I can choose. What I really mean is that I need a function to get the time of day. Perhaps that function is associated and it's bound to an object. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps perhaps it's just a local lambda that returns something in the context of a test. You know, the point there is it doesn't matter. This is encapsulated design, it doesn't matter. That's what encapsulation allows you to do. It allows you to decouple your concerns. Say, honestly, I don't care where that came from. I don't care about it. We have narrowed this down. It's a function that returns a time of day. That's it. That's brilliant. So now when I call it, I call it as time of day. The usage syntax is much clearer. My refactoring has, I've now gone and replaced. I've, so previously I had an extract interface and I moved something into standard, fairly standard refactorings, but this one, this one's a bit of a twist, but the best bit, the one weird trick is the next one. In most cases, not all, don't get me wrong, but in probably 90% of the cases where people, what we're using here and here is what we might talk, call the provider pattern you know, or supplier. In other words, what we've done is we've set up something to supply the value that we're interested in. Um, so basically we say, oh, I'm gonna call this thing and then it's gonna give me the thing that I want. You know, most of the time you should just give you the thing that it wants. Most of the time, what you need to do is pass in the time of day, unless somebody actually needs to hold on to that supplier, there's no point in doing that. 
you know, to quote the great Morpheus, stop trying to hit me and hit me. In most cases, you look at a lot of codes, like, wait a minute, you're passing this and it's a factory that's going to give that. And then, 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 and then this, then this piece of code gets the value that it was actually up. Why didn't you just give it the piece of value? Oh no, we've got to pass it through a configurator that gets injected that does this. Just give it the damn, just give it the damn string. That's, that's what it wants. It wants the value. Give it the value. Why are you horsing around? That's the whole point of refactoring is this kind of gradual annealing. It's this insight that you can get by going, oh, wait a minute, there's a simple problem here, trying to struggling to make itself hurt. But getting lost in a limited vocabulary, so uh, refactoring tools, great, a broad vocabulary, even better. But remember that they are part and parcel of a larger process that involves you. And that's how you're gonna create the stuff, that you're moving through these relatively stable intermediate forms with an occasional hiccup in its form as you have a moment of insight that cannot be expressed through these simple transitions and is often a, a, a huge pivot of uh, a piece of code. It might be a very small local pivot, but that insight is like, oh, just pass the value. Huh. Suddenly, most of the wretched mocking code in the world, the really bad stuff disappears and what's left behind is the essential mocking code, the stuff that actually matters. A lot of the time, people shouldn't be injecting anything into anything. They should just pass the value that the thing needs. And we've spent a lot of time avoiding the simple solution. It's like large organizations. A large organization is designed to prevent people from doing work. And it goes around and creates all the flows that prevent people from actually getting work done. You know what? We recreate Conway's law style in our own code bases, um, the uh, the bureaucracy of our larger organizations. We've ended up with Kafka-esque code bases. And what we should be looking is refactoring as an opportunity to move away from that. So um, quick question from, uh, uh, from Alex. Uh, would the same clock demo apply to random? For a given seed? Yes, it would. Don't test without knowing the seed. Do not use random stuff unless you know the seed, okay? That's so, you know, it's for a given seed, then yes, you'll get the same thing. Yeah. But, you know, if that's not solving your problem, as I said, 90% of the time, that clock thing is what you need. The other 10% of the time, you actually do need to hold on to the supplier for various reasons. And of course, if I'm actually going to use random, and I'm going to use something that's got a kind of actually some true real entropy, then of course, that's not going to be repeatable. And I wouldn't necessarily expect that. So thank you very much. I'm kind of done. I'm going to stop the screen share. Um, so uh, feel free to um, ask me questions. Uh, if you're in Zoom, uh, feel free to unmute um, uh, or you just, go. you're very welcome, Steve. Right, Fran? There you go. Book plug. I'll collect the beer later. I'm in, I'm in a war. <laughs> okay, questions, thoughts, reflections. Oh, okay. So yeah, can you pass that through the camera? <laughs> oh close close oh, you need ftp the food transfer protocol <laughs> oh oh protocol. never off duty are you dumb no <laughs> uh, i are we could you, yeah so questions thoughts reflections you 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 came at the end you you kind of almost switched topics into unit testing and mocking yes and i wonder if there's a similar idea or a similar kind of theme that you're trying to develop there about because you start off as being refactoring mm. isn't what we say it is and i learned yes. term recently from martin fowler actually semantic drift this is semantic drift yes. right? My words change yes that's and right you was i think you were talking about this on twitter as well and i was gonna come in and say i've experienced this thing with where the, the you know people go oh yeah I've nearly done I'm just doing the tests you know yes and is there uh, is is that part is this part of like a continuum do you feel that the, these things are all kind of bound yes. together yes I do and, and and actually your 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 observation is spot on the reason I ended up not totally jumping into TDD or um, any other kind of continuing continuous testing style is because that changes the scope of the talk and yeah. honestly that once you start yeah so in other words this was it's just like okay what what so actually okay origin story for this talk is actually is tdd um is because i had kind of you know people often say oh yeah you did the red green refactor thing and it turns out that the refactor bit is the bit that actually people silently struggle with the most there's an assumption that people just know what to do 
oh refactoring yeah yeah that's the easy bit it's like actually no they don't and i was blind to this for quite a while and i kind of keep thinking you know I, I need to somehow spend a bit more time here but because i always start talking about it from the tdd point of view i never have the time so i thought you know what let's let's access let's focus on what is just refactoring and t and the testing stuff will be around the edges and if there's any suggestion of a particular workflow that's for you to bring to it but really it's whether or not you have tests for some of these things but actually that's not the central theme but with the mocking, yeah, yeah it ties it in. But it's a case of I'm going to leave that at the edge because because that, that's that... where you're going, right? Because you, I mean, the it's particularly something I've been thinking about recently because I've been the work that I'm been just about finished actually. There's been a lot of Kotlin work in a kind of a cloud platformy things. So it's an awful mm. lot of and it's a lot of mocks coming in, and you look at some of the tests and go, is this actually testing anything? Yeah, but you're talking there about if we can refactor these things, you actually don't need that interface yeah. right you don't need yeah. that yes repository or whatever that yeah. service you just need seven actually at the top here right yeah. <laughs> or this thing of yeah whatever. yeah you don't need a you don't need a mock that returns a mock that returns a mock that returns a mock that you then yeah you don't need that there you know it, it, there are might be a few cases but let us reserve it for the few rather than the many um, and that, you know, and that's, that's it. So in other words, it's all driving towards the same thing. It's that idea of like using these, um, using these techniques as sensing techniques, they're giving me feedback. And it's just like, I wonder if, if this is the right way to go about this. Is, am I, you know, the code seems quite ambitious, but what am I really doing? And it's just like, yeah, I want to pass the value seven in. Oh, well, we've, we've, we've created a whole infrastructure to prevent seven getting to its ultimate <laughs> destination. You know, it's just that, um, you know, it's, it's like modern traffic management. It was, it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's measuring the wrong thing. Um, in many cases, it's just like, yeah, guess what? There's no traffic jams on that road when we do this flow system. It's just like, yeah, because you've now rooted everybody around the flow system, you've now got more traffic than you had before because cars are now spending longer in the traffic system. So you've actually got worse traffic than when you started. And, it, and that's the bit they've not figured out. And the same road safety stuff is done. Nobody gets run over on this road because nobody walks down that road because it's too dangerous. <laughs> that's genuinely it. If you want road safety improvement, somebody has to throw themselves into traffic and die. We I'm not quite traffic. sure where to take that metaphor back into the code. I was doing really well up until that point, but you, yeah, you, sorry, that's a, that's you know, you quite literally crossed the white lines there. I don't know what to do with that sorry, one, Jess. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, your observation is correct. This, these are interconnected and that's that's one of the ways. You can either say I'm moving towards that or I've moved from that. that yes. kind if we of sign up for the full day, that's where we go, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. Thank there you, you go. The next NordEFCON, we'll do a full day, yeah. No, thank you. That's that's really good. Thank you. Any other thoughts, you questions? Alex. Alex, you need to hold him we just gave we've, you a... we've got it. We've got it recorded, don't worry. I've got it, yeah. Uh, I did say that, didn't well, I? Yeah, and you said it on unfortunately on YouTube, which I'm yeah, now going to invite to. Off the back of it, that's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to invite them to get any any questions before we uh, yeah. take in some private Zoom, which sounds a bit yeah. unusual. Yeah, it gets dodgier from here on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> going to the uh, the night section. Yeah, the dark. Uh, yeah, night section of the talk. Don't know how long to give YouTube sometimes because it is a good few minutes behind, but they got they had their time. They had their time. We had some questions. Yeah, we give them Mars. a few years, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've dropped our Twitters and your Twitters on the on the chats as well. Oh, and uh, Lars had a question whether or not you had a rock star book. I did did make a shout out to chat to say or any other language books that we could challenge you with. Uh, no, um, I don't have no because I don't think Dylan. So Rockstar is um, language created by Dylan Beatty, and he. Um, I do not believe that Dylan. Dylan has spoken at great length um, about the implementation, um, and so the implement the JavaScript implementation is known as Satriani JS Joe Satriani. Um, it, it's um, it, yeah, Rockstar is an ESO lang. Um, the premise of Rockstar is that if you're not familiar with it is that people keep talking about rockstar programmers, recruiters keep talking, yeah, we need a rockstar programmer. And it's just such a dumb phrase. And, 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 and this thing went on Twitter a few years back, you know, and somebody said, somebody should create a language called rockstar because that will shut them up. So yeah, we need a rockstar program. Awesome. Hi, I'm yeah, I've got six developer. months in rockstar, you know, I, you know. So, and Dylan went ahead and actually created it. Uh, first of all, it was as a joke language, then he went and created the parser. 
and he's given talks on it. But he has not yet published a book. So no, there is no book to be had, but there is plenty of online documentation. If you, um, uh, you know, I can't remember what the website is, but Rockstar language or programming language. It looks like there. codewithrockstar.com. That's perhaps. it, Code with Rockstar. yes. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Sorry, that completely slipped me by. I just thought it was a normal, run-of-the-mill. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, a, it's the real deal. So thank you very much for that question, yeah. Incredible, incredible. I, I, I look forward to becoming a rock star developer very soon. There you go. <laughs> Oh, he's got merch as well. All done oh, wow. typically, typically in kind of like eighties, eighties um, hair metal style. You know, he's got one that's based on Def Leppard. He's got an ACDC based one. You know, it's just yeah. So there's merch to go with the language. It's a proper language, you know. Oh, there's some yeah, there's some tops that uh, to die for here, Paul. They're right up your street, rock star developer. Oh well, I should be sharing those in a moment. All right, well, well Eastside Lang's going... a great fun. Yeah. I'm going to I'm evict the like YouTubers. That. Good evening, YouTubers. We'll see you all later. Ciao. It's been good. Right. I've got a question from David here. What about Lisp? Wait a minute. I do have. <laughs> I've got a Lisp 1.5 book in the early 1960s. <laughs> it is. Hang on. Hang on. 